American Imperialism, 1865 through 1920. This lecture is going to cover the American expansion of foreign policy from the end of the Civil War through the administration of Woodrow Wilson. The policy and practice of exploiting nations and peoples for the benefit of an imperial power, either directly through military occupation and colonial rule, or indirectly through economic domination and resources and markets, is called imperialism. And this is what we're going to be looking at. The Roots of Imperialism Britain and France. In the latter part of the 19th century, the two main imperialist powers were Great Britain and France. Britain was able to create its empire primarily through superior technology, the Maxim gun, which is a machine gun, quinine, and steamboats. The United States foreign policy before 1895 had long established a tradition of expansion across the continent, but now it sought to expand further overseas, directly or indirectly through the acquisition of colonial possessions and the exportation of cultural ideas and institutions. American foreign policy before 1895, the United States maintained normal diplomatic and trade ties with foreign nations. In foreign policy, U.S. officials showed little interest in the continent of Africa, but in the words of Henry Cabot Lodge, we must not be left behind ideological and religious argument. So to make an argument for imperialism, we're going to look at the ideological and religious arguments. Scholars, authors, religious leaders, and politicians supplied related arguments for American imperialism that combine, first, social Darwinism. Herbert Spencer coined the term survival of the fittest, not Charles Darwin in which he called for free economic competition and natural selection and action. The fittest enjoyed wealth and success, and government should not make laws to interfere with the natural selection between rich and poor. In society are organisms that evolve. American social Darwinists saw their ideas and institutions were superior to those of inferior nations, a belief in racial inequality and Anglo-Saxon superiority. American imperialists often rationalized actions by expressing the opinion that people of Anglo-Saxon descent were of a superior culture, as seen in Rudyard Kipling's poem, Take Up the White Man's Burden. Then there's evangelical Christianity. The spread of Christianity, they believe, would help lesser nations develop morally. Reverend Josiah Strong in Our Country in Its Present Crisis in its possible future, published in 1886, dealt with the question, when and how should America begin to look beyond its continental borders to the world beyond? He suggested that the U.S. look overseas for its future. He considered the Anglo-Saxon people to be superior and picked by God to lead the world and spread its values and religion to others. President William McKinley we should remember, was elected on an imperialistic platform. Then there are strategic concerns. Captain Alfred Thayer Mahon emphasized the importance of a navy in an imperial expansion, which be known as Mahonism. In his influential book called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 1660-1783, published in 1890, Mahon traced Britain's growth as a world power, linking its growth as a sea power. If the United States were to emerge as a world power, the following things would need to happen. First, build a modern fleet. An expanded modern navy was needed to be built of steel, the need to establish naval bases in the Caribbean. This would help protect the United States. Due to the Euro European powers expanding in the Pacific, along with Japan, there needs to be an increased demand for an isthmus canal in, to bring the Pacific and Atlantic coast together. If the U.S. were a major sea power, an increase in harbors, refueling and repairing stations, trade, ships, etc. around the world would be needed, especially in the Pacific, and a need to acquire Hawaii and other Pacific islands to serve that purpose. With a larger modern navy and more naval bases, the United States could then expand and protect America's international trade. In the interest of, sea, of American sea power 1897, 
he would uh, theoretically say that the United States uh, needs to prepare to allow Germany to acquire the proposed canals of Panama and Nicaragua. Any foreign power purchasing naval bases in Haiti through which pass our streamer routes to the Isthmus, would she acquiesce to a foreign protectorate over the Sandwich Islands, which was Hawaii, the greater central station of the Pacific? Americans need to look outward in a new link to the Atlantic and Pacific, and Europe established colonies in the Pacific and the rise of Japan. Three things are needful. First, protection of the chief harbors by fortification and coastal defense ships. Secondly, naval force, the arm of the offensive power, which alone enables a country to expand its influence outward. Pure, and thirdly, no foreign state must henceforth acquire a coaling position within 3,000 miles of San Francisco. Economic Designs the second industrial revolution had generated a desire for new markets in which American manufacturers could sell their wares. Added to this was renewed European competition to colonize, this time in Asia and the Pacific Rim. American agricultural products had long competed with other nations on the world market. Now the industrial base had expanded to a point where many believed that it could do so as well. The primary goal of the American government's imperialistic politics was commercial expansion. In other words, when in doubt, it's all about money. The depression of the 1890s strengthened the foreign trade argument. Economic conditions that fueled support for foreign trade included a huge increase in the amount of manufactured goods produced in America. American prosperity now depended on larger access to foreign markets and resources which the highest percentage of Americans favored, increased international trade. Here we see the United States expansion in the Pacific in 1867 through 1899, pursuing a vision of commercial empire in the Pacific. The United States steadily expanded its territorial possessions as well as its influence there in the late 19th century. Expansion in the Pacific. Secretary of State William H. Seward paved the way for larger U.S. presence in world affairs. Seward purchased Alaska from the Russians in 1867. He also approved the occupation of Midway Island and pushed American trade on Japan. The purchase referred to as Seward's Folly or Seward's Icebox. Mocking the Alaskan purchase, this political cartoon shows President Andrew Johnson and Secretary of State William H. Seward welcoming the two new senators from Alaska, an Eskimo and a penguin. In 1878, in Samoa, granted the United States a naval base at Pago Pago and requested U.S. intervention to settle disputes if necessary. Germany and Britain worked out similar arrangements with other islands in the Samoan group. When civil war broke out in 1887, in a peace conference in Berlin, all three countries established a protectorate over Samoa in 1899. Hawaii. The Hawaiian Islands were united in 1795. Hawaiian royalty had, in 1875, entered to an agreement with the United States to import sugar duty-free. In other words, they don't pay any taxes. This created a boom in the production of sugar and soon, American planters, known as Heos in Hawaii, had flooded the island nation. In 1887, King Kalakua granted voting rights only to the wealthy. Treaties integrated into the Hawaiian Islands into the American economy and gave the United States control over Pearl Harbor. Then the McKinley Tariff in 1890 eliminated the duty-free status on sugar. Now. American sugar plantation growers would have to pay tariffs to import their Hawaiian sugar into the, the United States. 
Americas in Hawaii want the U.S. to annex them. The problem is Hawaii is a sovereign nation. Enter Queen Lililu Kalani, Hawaii's new and last ruler, tried to limit growing of U.S. power starting in 1891 by first removing the voting qualification of the Hores. John L. Stevens, in 1893, the royal family was ousted by these same planners with the help of U.S. Ambassador John L. Stevens, with the help of U.S. Marines, organized a revolution against the Queen, and a new government was established with the Hoholas in control. They declared a republic in 1894 with Sanford B. Dole as the first president. The new government requested territorial status and an annexation by the United States. President Grover Cleveland, whose research found that a majority of the native Hawaiians opposed the annexation and refused to accept it, as he did not want to reward the dishonorable actions of the planners. President William McKinley had no such concerns and secured the ratification of the treaty in 1898, despite protests by native Hawaiians. As other imperial powers looked on, the United States abandoned its traditional principles to rush headlong into world affairs. Latin America, the Pan American Conference. Led by Secretary of State James Blaine, representatives from various nations of the Western Hemisphere decided to create the Pan American Union for international cooperation on trade and other issues. Blaine had hoped to bring about reductions in tariff rates, but once again showing that the most important issue of imperialism was economics. The Pan American Union continues today as part of the Organization of American States, which was established in 1848. In Chile, tense relations between the United States and Chile arose over the United States' support of a failed revolution or heightened over an incident with American drunken sailors. A Chilean mob attacked sailors from the USS Baltimore, killing two and wounding twelve. Chile's reluctance to meet U.S. demands for an apology and a reparations for damages led President Harrison to send a war message to Congress. Chile quickly apologized and agreed to pay damages, but Pan-American goodwill was damaged. In Venezuela in 1895, there was a boundary dispute between Great Britain and Venezuela over led by an intervention by President Grover Cleveland, who wanted to challenge Britain for Latin American markets and to expand the Monroe Doctrine. The U.S. displayed increased aggressiveness when a boundary dispute between the British and the Venezuelans flared up again, only after gold was discovered in the disputed era. The exact boundary had been in dispute since the 1830s. But the area was again seriously threatened with war in 1895. Secretary of State Richard Olney, citing the Monroe Doctrine, declared that the U.S. would arbitrate the dispute, threatening war with Britain if they were not agreeable. London, facing hostilities in Europe, allowed the U.S. to arbitrate the boundary. A U.S. commission awarded most of the disputed territory to British Guyana, forging an area of Anglo-American friendship that would continue into the next century, but also further dampening U.S.-Latin American relations. The Spanish-American War Cuba Libre Cubans rebelled against Spain several times in the 19th century. In 1895, José Martí began another revolt. Each time insurrection broke out, it was put down bloodily, Motivated by a desire to protect American property, investments, as well as the Cuban rights, the Cleveland administration advised Spain to adopt reforms. Yellow Journalism Newspaper Circulation Wars In 1895-1897, William Randolph Hearst of the New York Journal challenged Joseph Pulitzer of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and the New York World for readership. Yellow journalism was a deliberate, sensational journalism of scandal and exposed and designed to attract an urban mass audience and increase advertising revenues. It's got its name from a popular comic strip called The Yellow Kid because he wore a yellow nightshirt. 
as you see in the political cartoon. The press sympathized with Cuban freedom fighters rebelling against Spain. When another attempt broke out in 1895, the Spanish commander, General Weiler, placed all Cubans in detention centers to prevent more from joining the cause. The press called him the butcher. Sensationalist journalists around America against feelings against Spain and the continued rebellion led to calls for American intervention. Frederick Remington was sent by Hearst to cover the Cuban uprising. Remington will send a wire to Hearst complaining that there is no war. Hearst replied to Remington, you provide the pictures and I'll provide the war. An example of this is the drawing to the Spaniards searching women on American steamers. To the reader, they see Spanish males looking at a naked American woman. Now, these were actually searched by Spanish female authorities to see if she was drink, uh, bringing any letters to Jose Marti. So it's just a half truth. Growing tensions. Once McKinley was inaugurated, issues in Cuba grew even more tenuous. Rebels released a captured letter to Hearst Journal written by Spain's ambassador to the United States, Señor Tope de Lom, to a friend in Cuba. In it, the ambassador criticized the United States president as a weak leader. Although essentially a true assessment of McKinley, the letters touched off a storm of protest in the United States against Spain forcing DeLone to resign his post. In January of 1898, the USS Maine was ordered to Havana Harbor on a friendly mission. Although it was preparing to evacuate American citizens in the face of increasing riots against Spain, shortly thereafter, the Maine exploded, killing 260 sailors. At first, the explosion was blamed on a mine in the harbor, but a 1976 study revealed that it had been an internal explosion. As if the news of the Maine were not disturbing enough, the New York Journal sought to sensationalize the incident by offering a $50,000 reward for the perpetrators, the equivalent of $1.3 million. On March 27th, the United States sent several demands to Spain to agree to a ceasefire. On April 9th, the Governor General of Cuba offered the Spanish rebels an armistice. Spain indicated a willingness to negotiate over Cuba's independence. McKinley yielded to public pressure by sending a war message to Congress on April 11th. McKinley's war message to Congress called for U.S. intervention to help free the oppressed Cubans, having correctly perceived a pro-war attitude among Americans. Congress was not unanimous in its declaration because many members feared that the U.S. might be improperly perceived by the international community as ganging up on a weaker nation to gain territory. To get support for the war, the Teller Amendment, a congressional resolution was adopted in 1898 to soothe the critics and guaranteed Cuba's independence, stating that the United States had no designs on Cuba. It also called for the Cuban self-government. On April 20, 1898, Congress would declare war on Spain. On April 24th, Spain would declare war on the United States. The Philippine Theater. The war only lasted 113 days. John Hay, United States Ambassador to England, had written Theodore Roosevelt, referring to it as a splendid little war. Under Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt resigned to participate in the fighting. Before he left, he ordered Commodore Dewey, the man you see pictured there, to take and destroy the Spanish fleet in Manila. Emilio Aguinaldo was returned from exile to aid Filipino insurrectionists against Spain. In the Battle of Manila Bay on May 1, 1898, Commodore George Dewey led the Pacific fleet and quickly demolished the Spanish Navy there, provisioned his ships, and left to attack the Spanish colony in the Philippine Islands. In just hours, the entire Spanish Asiatic fleet is sunk. What is interesting is that the Spanish commander, Antojo, was informed that Dewey had ships and had seen in Subic Bay that morning, 
but he believed the expected an attack the following morning due to mines in the bay. However, Dewey had detailed information of the state of the Spanish challenges and the lack of preparedness of the Spanish fleet, prompting him to enter the bay immediately at 5.41 a.m. with the now famous phrase, you may file when ready, Gridley. The USS Olympia's captain was instructed to begin the destruction of the Spanish flotilla. Two hours later, Captain Gridley messaged that, he, that only 15 rounds of five-inch ammunition remained per gun. He ordered an immediate withdrawal to preserve morale. He informed the crews that the halt in the battle was to allow the crews to have breakfast. A captain's conference on the Olympia revealed little damage and no men had been killed. It was also discovered that the original ammunition message had been garbled. Instead of only 15 rounds of ammunition per gun, the message was meant to say only 15 rounds of ammunition per gun has been expanded. Cancel breakfast! Breakfast was immediately canceled, much of it to the disappointment of the crews, and the battle commenced. The Spanish raised a white flag, and the battle was over at 12.40 p.m. Dewey had no soldiers to put on the shore, and he remained several months waiting for reinforcements. As the British and the German warships cruised offshore waiting to strike, yet the Americans did not seize the Philippines. On August 13th, Emilio Aguinaldo declared the Philippines independent, and on June 12th, 1898, uh, with his help, Manila was captured. On August 13th, victory led to the annexation of Hawaii and the desire to keep the Philippines for future markets. The Cuban Campaign U.S. casualties U.S. casualties resulted more from disease and exposure, 5,000, than from the Battle of 300. The Battle of Santiago de Cuba On the morning of May 29th, Severa's squadron was sighted inside the safety of Santiago Bay. So long as Severa remained within Santiago Harbor, his fleet was relatively safe. The guns of the city were quite sufficient to make up for the deficiency in his own, and the area was well defended with sea mines, torpedoes, and other obstructions. On July 3rd, Nevertheless, the Spanish government ordered Severa, six ships, to break out from the bay. All were intercepted by the American battleships and cruisers under Rear Admiral William T. Sampson and Commodore William S. Schley. In a running battle, superior American firepower reduced Severa's ships to burning wrecks. Casualties in the course of the fighting, Sampson and Schley's fleet lost a miraculously one man killed, Yeoman George H. Ellis of the USS Brooklyn, and 10 wounded. Severa lost all six of his ships, as well as 323 killed and 151 wounded. In addition, approximately 70 officers, including the Admiral and 1,500 men, were taken prisoner. San Juan Hill, the Rough Riders. The army assembled in Tampa. Among them were the first volunteer cavalry, Theodore Roosevelt's Rough Riders. They were a special regiment made up of former Ivy League athletes, Irish policemen, cowboys from Oklahoma, New Mexico, Texas Rangers, and including Cherokee and Choctaws. On July 1st, 7,000 soldiers took the fortified village of El Cane, while much larger forces attacked San Juan Hill, including the Rough Riders, who were on foot since their horses were sent elsewhere. General Joseph Wheeler, a former Confederate general of the Civil War, led the division through the Siege of Santiago. During the excitement of the battle, Wheeler supposedly called out, Let's go, boys! We got them damn Yankees on the run again! But the old general confusing his wars. He thought he was back in the Civil War at Bull Run. The Charge 
The battle for San Juan Hill, Roosevelt ordered his men to rise and charge the Spaniards. Although shot in the arm, T.R. headlong galloped towards the Spanish lines. For his bravery, Roosevelt was put in for the Congressional Medal of Honor. It did not come due to his scathing letter he would later write about the treatment of veterans that fought in the Spanish-American War. He finally was awarded his medal posthumously in 2001 by President Bill Clinton. Roosevelt was a hero. A crucial role in capturing San Juan Hill was played by the 10th Negro Cavalry, known as the Buffalo Soldiers. The military victory in Cuba was swift, with naval power again providing decisive U.S. forces to seize Puerto Rico. On July 16th, General Linares would finally surrender, and on July 25th, Puerto Rico would be invaded. Consequences of Victory McKinley's Motives As a result of the Spanish-American War, William McKinley expressed a desire to acquire the Philippines. American business leaders wanted the United States to keep the Philippines so they could penetrate the market so nearby China. Not long after the United States' control, the Roman Catholic Church status as the Philippines' official religion was over. English would become the official language, opening the door for Protestant missionaries in the region. McKinley summarized the motivating ideas for American imperialism. First, national glory. Second, commerce. Three, a racial superiority. And four, evangelism. It also should be noted that if the United States had left the Philippines, Great Britain and Germany more than likely would have taken it. The Treaty of Paris. The treaty included the following items. The armistice required Spain to accept Cuban independence. Spain would cede, which means to give, Puerto Rico and Guam to the United States. The Spanish also ceded the Philippines to the United States for $20 million, sparking a strong, bitter debate over imperialism. The Anti-Imperialist League that included William Jennings Bryan, Andrew Carnegie, and Jane Addams opposed the Treaty of Paris. They claimed that acquiring the Philippines denied life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to the Filipino people. Did the Constitution follow the flag? Anti-imperialists claimed yes. The imperialists said no. And the insular cases the Supreme Court made between 1901 and 1903 insular meaning the island cases, that constitutional rights are not automatically extended to territorial possessions. The power to decide was left to Congress. The treaty would barely pass the Senate 57 to 27 by two votes on February 6, 1899. In the political cartoon, we see Uncle Sam considers the expansionist menu offered by President McKinley. The Sandwich Islands, Hawaii, was only the appetizer. The Philippine-American War, 1899-1902. to The Filipino nationalists were fighting Spain for independence before U.S. intervention. Rebel leaders such as Emilio Aguinaldo welcomed Dewey's victory and issued a Declaration of Independence proclaiming the Philippine Republic. The Filipinos felt betrayed by the Treaty of Paris. The American ownership and the same guerrillas that Dewey had relied on to secure Manila before the army could arrive now fought against U.S. colonization or control of the Philippines. A long, brutal war erupted between the United States and the Filipinos in which an estimated 400,000 Filipinos died, most in concentration camps, similar to what the Spanish had in Cuba. The anti imperialist League was revived. American brutality that it was reported in the press reviving the anti imperialist League. Andrew Carnegie offered $20 million to buy independence for the Philippines. Mark Twain called it a quagmire that the United States should try not to get under the heel or intervene in any other country that is not ours. 
Senator R let the opposition in the Congress stating that in the Constitution, no power is given the federal government to acquire territory to be held and the government permanently as colonies or to conquer the alien people to hold them in subjugation. Unfortunately, I guess the senator forgot that the United States did that to the Indians. The ministers denounced imperialism as anti-Christian. Organizing the colonies. In a Latin America where no major powers challenged American objectives, the United States was more successful in exercising imperial power. The Philippines eventually was added as a territory to the United States, and Roosevelt named future President William Howard Taft its first U.S. governor. The Jones Act. Succeeding legislation provided for greater Filipino control of the islands, culminating in their independence on July 4th, 1946. They were going to be granted independence earlier, but due to the Second World War, they had to wait. Puerto Rico, which had come under U.S. control in the peace treaty with Spain, was organized to provide a bastion for future European aggression and as a guard post for future Isthmus Canal linking the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. American annexation of Puerto Rico had mixed results as transportation and sanitation were improved and public and education was developed. The Faracker Act of 1900, Puerto Ricans established a government on the island and its residents were declared citizens of the Commonwealth or Puerto Rico, but not Spain. Dr. Walter Reed, named head of the Army, Yellow Fever Commission in 1900, proved that mosquitoes carry yellow fever, and the commission's experience led the way to effective control of the disease worldwide. The United States would finally grant citizenship and other rights to Puerto Ricans in 1917, and would be allowed to craft its own constitution, but was limited in its freedom by the Platt Amendment, which placed restrictions on its rights. Cuba had to sell or lease the United States uh, for calling in naval stations, which would become the U.S. naval base in Guantanamo Bay. Imperial Rivalries in East Asia, the First Sino-Japanese War. By 1895, Japan had began to expand by defeating China in the First Sino-Japanese War, 1894 to 1895, taking several islands and more importantly, revealing China's weakness against aggression. By the mid 1890s, several European powers had carved out spheres of influence in China a region dominated and controlled by an outside power. The American business community was alarmed by European actions that would limit American opportunities in China. In 1899, Secretary of State John Hay asked the imperial powers to maintain a commercial and financial open door, free trade, for all nations. The open door became a doctrine of U.S. foreign policy and was used to dominate foreign markets. Japan favored the open door policy, but Russia did not. In 1900, a group of Chinese nationalists known as the Boxers, or Fist of Righteous Harmony, rebelled against the foreign encroachment into their country, but they were eventually put down by intervention from a joint assault of British, German, Russian, and Japanese forces. In the political cartoon to the left, we see the United States usually preferred the annexation of trade to the annexation to territory. The open door policy promised to advance American commercial expansion, but Uncle Sam had to restrain other imperialists with colonial objections. Roosevelt's Big Stick Diplomacy. Theodore Roosevelt was the first modern president in fact, it can be argued that he, more than any other president, shaped what America expected of presidents in this era. In his youth, Teddy suffered from asthma when he was young. He drove himself to physical feats to make his own body. At Harvard, he boxed and wrestled and graduated with honors. Tragedy struck him in 1884. In the same house, on the same day, his mother, Mitty, died. And 11 hours later, his first wife, Alice, died, who had been given birth to their firstborn, a daughter also named Alice, two days earlier. The light has gone out of my life, 
said Roosevelt. And so he sought solace in his ranch in South Dakota. Roosevelt, the rich blue blood from New York, when learned the hard life of a cowboy in South Dakota. He had later claimed, it knocked the snobbery out of me. His return to politics, Roosevelt had a simple philosophy. In a world where there were two camps, good and evil, and he was determined to fight evil as he saw in political corruption. He served three terms in the New York Assembly. He cleaned up the New York City's corrupt police department as chief of police. He campaigned for McKinley in 1896 and was awarded assistant secretary of Navy. His glory as a rough rider with the 1st Volunteer Cavalry in charge up a San Juan Hill got him elected to New York governor. From vice president to president, Political bosses in New York found Teddy Roosevelt, T.R., hard to control. He could not be bought. With his rising star, the political bosses were afraid the next step would be President of the United States. Boss Platt came up with an idea. Bump him upstairs to be McKinley's VP. And that way, in four years, no one will remember Teddy. McKinley would find himself once again running against William Jennings Bryan. The main issue was imperialism. T.R. crisscrossed the nation condemning Bryan's communistic and socialist doctrines. McKinley would easily defeat Bryan, 292 to 155 electoral votes, and by more than a, a million in the votes in the popular category. Then McKinley was assassinated on September 14, 1901, by Leon Cholgos, making Roosevelt the youngest president ever to hold the office. Mark Hanna would say, ah, now that damn cowboy is president of the United States. Big stick policy. The modern president. T.R. became the youngest president in U.S. history at the age of 42. T.R. believed in using what he called the bully pulpit. In other words, if you don't really get your way, go before the American people and use the press to convince Congress. T.R. also believed in the old African proverb, speak softly and carry a big stick and you shall go far. For using in diplomacy, you speak softly. If that doesn't work, bam, you hit him with the big stick. Roosevelt did have his critics who believed that he was too bombastic, too loud, and didn't care whatever came out of his mouth or whom he insulted or hurt by using name calling. The Spanish-American War intensified American interest in the canal through Central America, and there seemed to be a need for a canal. The Panama Canal. The hay Phosphate Treaty in 1901 between the United States and Great Britain granted the U.S. exclusive rights to a canal in Latin America, choosing Panama the U.S. Congress expressed a willingness to pay as much as $40 million for the rights of the new Panama Canal Company. In 1903, the Hay-Heron Treaty between the United States and Colombia gave U.S. rights to a six-mile wild zone in Panama for 100 years. After initially paying $10 million and annually $250,000 to Colombia. On August 12th, Colombia's Senate failed to ratify the treaty hoping to hold out for $25 million. In 1903, in November, Panamanians broke out in revolution after negotiations broke down between the United States and Colombia. A new government was organized. Panamanian independence was declared on November 4th and led by a major investor in the new Panama Canal Company, Felipe Buena Varilla. On November 6th, the revolution was recognized officially by the United States, who secretly supported the rebels by preventing Colombian troops from intervening into Panama. On November 18th, the Hay Buena Varela Treaty gave the U.S. similar terms as it had sought from Colombia. Rent payments not beginning until nine years, with the U.S. receiving permanent rights to the canal zone. And the debate over the Panama, Roosevelt bragged, I took the canal. Let Congress debate it. After the revolution, Panama became a U.S. protectorate in 1904. 
In building the canal, Theodore Roosevelt's strategy inquiring it revealed a growth of good relationships with Great Britain. Construction of the Panama Canal began in 1904 and was completed in 1914. In 1906, Roosevelt became the first president of the United States to go outside the United States as president, visiting Panama in the spring of 1906. Here we see him pictured to the left, sitting at a crane at the Panama Canal. It cost the United States $366 million to build it. In 1921, a treaty with Colombia gave them $25 million for the loss of Panama, plus duty-free use of the canal in exchange for the recognition of Panamanian independence. The Roosevelt Corollary. In 1902, Venezuela defaults on loans for Britain, Germany, and Italy. In the Dominican Republic in 1903, after the Dominican Republic defaulted on several debts to European nations, many nations considered sending in troops to force them to repay their debts because European intervention violated the Moreau Doctrine. The U.S. would intervene when needed. The U.S. was responsible for proper redress for wrongs inflicted on a foreign state by a nation within the American sphere of influence. Chronic wrongdoing in Latin America might force the U.S. to step in as an international police force, influencing when it benefited U.S. interests. On December 6, 1904, the Roosevelt Corollary was adopted. In the light of the debt default of the Dominican Republic, Roosevelt sent a message to Congress, which became known as the Roosevelt Corollary, which was designed to restore order in Latin American affairs and prevent European intervention. Roosevelt's policy, asserting U.S. authority to intervene in the affairs of Latin American nations, was a logical extension of the Monroe Doctrine. It attempted to justify U.S. intervention and authority in Latin America. Latin Americans resented U.S. claims to unilateral authority. But what is not mentioned in the book, and it is true, if he had not done this, Germany, Britain, Belgium, and other countries would have to intervene and possibly set up colonies. Relations with Japan At the beginning of the 20th century, Japan and Russia were more deeply involved in East Asia than in the United States. The main Asian imperialist power around the turn of the century was Japan. America's chief rival for domination in the Pacific. Then comes the Russo-Japanese War in 1904. Japan attacked Russia in 1904 when Japan felt that Russia's ambitions counteracted its own. The European powers and the U.S. felt the Russians would demolish the Japanese. In a brilliant attack on the Japanese Navy, Japan destroyed its fleet. Roosevelt sponsored a meeting between the two nations, and the result was the Treaty of Portsmouth of 1905. America had supported Japan in the Russo-Japanese War because Russia had instructed open trade in Manchuria. Roosevelt in 1904 offered to mediate on condition that the open door be recognized regarding China. He negotiated the treaty to end the war and marked Japan's emergence as a major power. Japan gained recognition of the permanence of Korea, some small territorial concessions, including a half of Sakhalin Island, South Manchuria Railway, and southern Liatong Peninsula. Although military defeated, Russia did not have to pay indemnity to Japan, but had its dominant role in Manchuria reduced. For his efforts of achieving the treaty and ending the war, Theodore Roosevelt would become the first President of the United States to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1906. The Gentlemen's Agreement While Roosevelt met with Russian and Japanese leaders to secure the peace, he sent William Howard Taft to Tokyo to secure an agreement with Japan in which Japan disavowed any claim to the Philippines in return for U.S. recognition of Japanese control of the Korean Peninsula. However, Distrust reigned on both sides, and when the city of San Francisco ordered Asian students to attend separate schools, Japan protested the action vigorously. Roosevelt forced the city to change its policy while securing the Gentlemen's Agreement, that Japan would no longer issue visas for citizens to visit the United States. The Root-Takahira Agreement of 1908 
Secretary of State Elijah Root, you see on the left, and Japanese Ambassador Takahira, you see on the right, exchanged notes pledging the mutual respect for each nation's specific possessions. For the United States, this would be the Philippines, in support of the open door policy in China. The Great White Fleet was the popular nickname for the United States battle fleet that completed the circumnavigation of the globe from December 16, 1907 to February 22, 1909, by the order of Theodore Roosevelt. It consisted of 16 battleships divided into two squadrons, along with various escorts. Roosevelt sought to demonstrate growing American military power and blue water Navy capacity, hoping to enforce treaties and protect overseas holdings. The U.S. Congress appropriated funds to build American sea power, and beginning with just 90 small ships, over one-third of them wooden, the, newly, the Navy quickly grew to include new modern steel fighting vessels. The hulls of these ships were painted a stark white, giving the Armada the nickname the Great White Fleet. Now we look at President William Howard Taft and Woodrow Wilson's foreign policy. First, let's begin with Taft and his dollar diplomacy. Taft followed many of Roosevelt's policies, especially through the use of his so-called dollar diplomacy, substituting dollars for bullets to promote U.S. interest in the Caribbean, Latin America, and East Asia. Taft State Department sent foreign aid to support American companies in these regions. First, let's look at where it was used for railroads in China. Taft first tested his policy in China, wanting U.S. bankers to be included with the British, French, and the German plans to invest in railroads in China. Taft succeeded in securing American participation in an agreement signed in 1911. However, the United States was excluded to build railroads in the province of Manchuria by Japan and Russia, which was a direct defiance of the U.S. open door policy that both agreed to. Russia and Japan agreed to treat Manchuria as a jointly held sphere of influence. For intervention, Taft also intervened militarily to ensure political and economic stability in areas in which he believed U.S. interests were threatened. Most notably, Taft sent U.S. Marines to intervene in a revolution in Nicaragua starting in 1909. The Marines would remain there until it finally withdrawn in 1933. Wilson's intervention. He opposed big stick imperialism and dollar diplomacy. The Jones Act was f gave full territorial status, universal male suffrage to Puerto Ricans, a Bill of Rights granted independence once a stabilized government could be formed in 1917. U.S. citizenship living in governing Panama in 1914 and no free rides of passage for U.S. ships. This angered T.R. and Lodge, and the British were in full support. When William Jennings Bryan was appointed as his Secretary of State, he appeared to usher in a new period in which interventionism would not be emphasized and submit to international commissions and negotiated a conciliation treaty within 21 nations, providing a one-year cooling-off period when disputes arose between signatories rather than engage immediately in open hostilities. But Wilson was a hypocrite. He repudiated the intervention policies of the Republicans when campaigning for president, but became the most interventionist president in American history. He sent interventionist forces more than Taft and Roosevelt combined, seeking to expand U.S. dominance in the Caribbean, to expand economic interest and possessing a racist attitude of Latin Americans as being inferior. He intervened in Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and Cuba. Mexico. Mexi Wilson also became embroiled in the Mexican Revolution. Pancho Villa was opposed to the Carranza government. He originally had support of Woodrow Wilson, but he raided the United States in hopes of provoking intervention against the Carranza government. In retaliation for a raid, in Texas and New Mexico, led by Mia, Wilson sent troops into Mexico. United States General 
John J. Black but Jack Pershing led these 6,000 soldiers in chasing Villa to the mountains of northern Mexico for nearly a year. By 1917, the American troops were sent home, as Wilson had become distracted by the threat of a great war in Europe.